Um, this, this particular symposium is really exciting for me, um, and I wish I could be there to see all of um, the familiar faces and colleagues, um, but it is really exciting to get to share this science, so thank you for this opportunity. Um, so my talk is about hunting for dark matter fungi, and um, it's kind of a tree of life talk. Um, and let me... Um, sort of explain why I chose that title. Um, I'm gonna use this sort of like metaphor of a uh, tree in the dark. And um, that is our fungal tree of life. We, we generally know its structure, we know it's big, but there's a lot that we don't know about it. Um, you know, we, we sample extant taxa and we, um, and we observe their characteristics, but we know that that's just a small uh, proportion of the total diversity. And, you know, we want to use this tree to do many things in biology, um, but there are dark areas of the tree where we don't have samples. And when we, you know, try to infer a phylogeny and trace some kind of um, character on it, um, we're subject to what we know and what we don't know has an influence on the result that we, that we get. And um, for example, this is a reconstruction of say uh, the, the flagellation or the presence of a flagellum and fungi. And this is maybe an earlier view. What we wanna do is to know the tree better and to understand that it's um, all, all the various regions where we, where we didn't have data before the so-called um, dark branches of the tree. And when we do that, and when we look at the character states of those, um, the total tree, we can see how having better sampling completely changes our understanding of the evolution of a character. So like, for example, if it was a flagellum. Okay, so, you know, I, this, this term dark matter fungi is used to describe the fact that there's this huge gap between what we know and what we predict. And the dark matter is the stuff that we predict um, on the basis of estimates of total diversity. And those estimates um, have been a, a major um, rallying cry for mycology in the last two decades. And um, we know that there's a great diversity out there um, that we've yet to really describe well. And what we have described is, is just, you know, maybe 10% or even less of the total diversity. Um, and, and we're told so, um, well, I, I wanna make a point that even of the stuff that we have described, um, we don't have DNA uh, data for it. So in, in some senses, it's hard to compare with the, um, the rest of the predicted diversity, but you can go out and, and do a, a a study like this um, really important study by Tetersu et al, where they did this global sampling of soil and cataloged everything they found and found, you know, about 45,000 species and only about 10% of them fit in with this described uh, taxa. So here we're tapping in and, and saying that there is this um, dark matter of, of um, taxa that are we know exist because they they basically appear when we do um, a, a DNA sequencing study, but we don't actually know what those species are. And, you know, and if we try to use uh, um, approaches like classical methods of culturing, they, um, they only re reveal a very small proportion of the total diversity, but those studies are really fundamental. And I'll we'll talk about one reason why, or one example in which this was the case. So our, our lab is, is trying to tackle this dark matter problem by um, one, having a, a, a well-constructed phylogeny that um, serves as a, is, is sort of a roadmap or a backbone for, for putting this um, novel diversity into context, phylogenetic context. Um, we are also using the, um, using, these approaches of like meta barcoding to try to explore areas of the tree which we think are undersampled and are likely to contain this um, these uh, dark matter taxa. And we're specifically interested in 
going after taxa that we we know have been described so that we only you know if there's only two thirds of the taxa have ever been sequenced um I'm sorry, if only one third of the tax have ever been sequenced, we know there's a lot of stuff out there that we that have been observed. And we want to try to track those taxa down and sequence them and then try to compare them with the um, the tax that have been described on the basis of DNA sequence alone. So we want to bridge basically microscopy and DNA. And um, and then once we have sequence, we want to, to, um, to predict what those organisms that we're detecting it can actually do. So we're working on, on a, approaches to take genome sequences and then say something about the ecological function or cell biology of those organisms. So I'm gonna first talk about our um, tree of life work and make the point that a lot of what we think of in terms of fungi when we when we discuss fungi is focused on the um, the dicaria and there's a good reason for it because these are 98 percent of the described species um, but it has a particular life cycle that's attached to it and that in the name dicaria comes from this heterokaryotic stage but the, the general idea, and this is something we teach in, in basic biology and introductory genetics, is that fungi have a very different life cycle than other um, kingdoms like animals and plants, where they animals have a, a diploid dominated life cycle and plants have alternation of generations, and fungi are supposed to have mostly haploid mitosis and, and very little diploid mitosis. But the point is that um, this is really based on observations in dicaria, and you can even, you know, listening to Anna talk, you can see we really don't even have a great understanding of, of life cycles of AMF fungi, these ubiquitous fungi. And but then within fungi, there's all this um, diversity of lineages that have been poorly studied, and, and especially in terms of genetics. Okay, so our, 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 um, understanding of fungi is very tilted towards dicaria. And our lab has um, been really um, interested in exploring many questions using zoosporic fungi. Um, and zoosporic fungi are um, just basically the, the fungi that reproduce with a modal spore. And um, they do things like attack pollen and attack algae. Um, and a typical uh, zoosporic fungus Sometimes they're called chytrids, um, produces like a sporangium, and the sporangium has these filamentous rhizoids that are involved in anchoring um, and nutrient absorption. And but these are these are the zoospork fungi, and they are um, that zoospore is, is sort of an an old homology with the animal um, flagellum. And, and sperm cells. And so um, that's a trait that existed in the early branches of the fungi and was lost um, as we go deeper into, into time in the fungal tree. Now I'm going to talk about our phylogenomic reconstruction based on the chytrids. And it's really, um, you know, it really owes itself to the people pictured here, um, Joyce Longcore and Martha Powell and Pete Letcher. And here's Rayburn Simmons, um, Joyce's PhD student, who's now a postdoc in the lab, who, um, who did a lot of this work. And, um, but the, the point is that these, these great biologists have, have devoted their lives to understanding the diversity of the chytrids, and they developed these massive culture collections. And that's something that I've um, been fortunate to become the steward of. And we have this uh, emerging collection called the Collection of Zoosporic Fungi at the University of Michigan. Um, and just to say, I wanted to give credit to, to these wonderful biologists before talking about what the, the data show. Um, so we, we have all these cultures and we're um, generating a phylogeny from them. Um, and, you know, there's not a ton of points I want to belabor here, but we, we sequenced about 70 chytrids and we predict their, um, we add them to the existing data. We then search for um, 
homologous genes and then we filter them and then we have you know a couple approaches that are pretty standard now for phylogenomic methods one is that you take all the data and you concatenate it together or you um, estimate the individual gene phylogenies separately and then you try to um, fit them into this uh, best fitting species tree and so in the end, we had about 487 proteins that we felt were um, pretty reliable. And this is what the, the data look like. Um, so obviously, this is pretty hard to read. And, it, and a lot of it is some interesting detail in terms of the chytrid taxonomy. Um, but the main points are that the tree is relatively well supported. Um, the, the star or the diamonds here are nodes where there's a difference between the concatenated tree and the coalescence tree. Um, and, but what we, what we recover is, is um, seven distinct phyla of zoospork fungi. So we have um, rosello mycota, which go with microsporidia, aphylidio mycota, then branch to chytridio mycota, uh, Neocalamastico mycota and Monoblepharido mycota. Man, this is a really mouthful. Um, but then there's and then there's two additional um, phyla here. And I'm going to kind of gloss over these characters and and focus really on on the one which has to do with life cycles. Um, and this is where we got the data from. So when you do um, when we do this genome sequencing. If we use short read approaches, so like Illumina genome sequencing, we have very high coverage. And that coverage, and it's pretty accurate too, we can use that coverage to look at um, heterozygosity. And, and Anna talked about this in her last talk, but the, the two things we can look for are um, the coverage of particular words. So in here we have a, a plot of um, the coverage, which is also depth of 23 base pair words. And here's sort of our modal coverage here and around 700 X. And where the word is interrupted by a polymorphism, it divides our coverage in half. And so we'll split this, um, those, that particular word into two equal words. Um, equally abundant words. And when we have high coverage, we can observe um, that the frequencies of these two alleles, like this A and this T in this, in this particular example, are right around centered at 50%. So when we look at and see that our allele frequencies look like this, we have very high confidence that this is a bona fide heterozygosity. So we're taking all this data um, together and we try to um, reconstruct the, um, the ancestral states of ploidy in, in the early branches of the fungi. And what we observe is that um, also in, in, this, in this tree, this is like the out group here, the blue um, circles are diploids that we recovered and the reds are haploids that we recovered. And what you can see is that blue is spread throughout the phylogeny. I mean, there are some clades that are almost always haploid, and this would be like spazellomycetes. Um, and mucormycota uh, always came out as haploid. But um, most of these zoospork lineages have a large proportion that are diploid. And just down here are the, um, the likelihood um, estimates for um, each of the two states at some critical nodes. So, the sort of the, the thing that this has um, told us is that the fungi for a large portion of their evolution were either um, diploid or could, could be diploid in, in the dominant part of their life cycle. And when I say this, the dominant part of their life cycle is because these are mostly cultures, right? So where they're growing in this mitotic state and they turn out to be diploid. Okay, so now I'm going to um, go to the second thing that we're doing, which is to, you know, add into the tree in places where we know that there should be these 
um, really interesting um, environmental uh, DNA based dark matter. So things that parts of the tree that have um, very high diversity, very little vouchered material. So to do this, this is my cartoon of, of, of the current gold rush we're in is you, you take you know, your sample and you put it into the sequencer and out comes this really interesting biodiversity. And um, it's really, it's really fun stuff. Um, but, you know, how much longer can this go on? How much, how much more will we be gaining in, in discovering in terms of novel diversity? So, at, at least in my area of the, of mycology, it, it, this was a major, um, discovery, which was that um, right at the base of the tree, right at the base of the fungi, there's a group that we call either cryptomycota or rosellomycota that has a ton of, um, of, of diversity, but based almost entirely on environmental DNA sequences. And so here's the paper that was now it's 10 years ago, um, where they showed some of this diversity and all of this bit here in this in this area is um, environmental DNA sequences and then somewhere near towards the root of this clade is rosella alamysis which is a endoparasite of water molds okay and so here's an example where a large amount of, of uh, fungal dark matter resides and we are trying to understand like what this stuff does and and the approach that we're trying to use is to um, sample from different places and then to look particularly at um, at the type of sample where we're we're we're, um, we're recovering or recovering these taxa from and then to relate those samples to each other and, and habitat is of course the very crude way of looking at them but when you do this by habitat you can see that um, samples taken from soil are distinctive to some degree of samples from fresh water. Um, and we believe that probably most of these cryptomycota, rosellomycota are, um, are parasites. And so it makes perfect sense that you know, soil would be distinct from, from um, water. Another uh, very interesting group that is um, also considered a dark matter clade is archaeorhizomycetes. And this is the group that Anna Rosling described um, now also 10 years ago. And you can see that, uh, that well, one of, one of the things is that there's just a ton of, of diversity in this group. And all of this is, is known ex almost exclusively from, um, from environmental DNA sequencing, but there are these serendipitous cultures that can be made. And these are really important. So it sort of goes to, as a point to emphasize that not only do we need to continue to culture, um, we need to find better ways of culturing um, so that we can, can have material for which we can start to, to um, look at and to generate phenotypes. Um, Here's a picture of this Archaeorhizomyces inoculated onto a pine seedling. It seems to like growing on the seed, seedling roots, but it doesn't really colonize um, inside the plant. So it's still actually a pretty big mystery what this fungus is doing in nature. So here's two pretty, um, pretty large groups full of, of dark matter fungi. Um, I'm trying to answer to a little bit this question of how many more lineages could there be out there. Um, returning to this um, Teter Su study, in, in that study, which was done using ribosomal ITS marker, 6% um, of the, the, the taxa could not be assigned to phylum. So that's pretty exciting. It could potentially mean that, um, that these taxa are novel phylum, or at least really novel branches on the fungal tree. So um, what Teter Su did was to take, so he just had this like small bits of ITS2 region, and then 
decided to, and so you can't make a tree, you can't put this stuff in a tree when you only have ITS2. So the approach they used was to um, sort of use the, the sequence in ITS2 to PCR out to the flanks. So uh, a, a, a primer inside a known sequence and then out to general primers and track down these, these um, un, unplaced sequences. And, and this is the tree that resulted from this. And the, the things in red are from that study. And you can see they place in all sorts of parts of the tree. Um, there's some clade in glomeromycota. Um, there's a ton of stuff that place in the rosella mycota. And there's even a clade that's related to archaea rhizomycetes. So, but um, what didn't really happen was the discovery of many new phyla. There is this one really basal clade, GSO, GSO1 at the base. But other than that, there weren't probably any phylum level uh, diversity that was uncovered in this. Okay, so the, the next part I'm going to talk about has to do with our approaches to link the um, historically described taxa to, to the, um, the environmental DNA. So what we really want to do is to be able to visualize taxa in, in nature and to without and, and, and skipping the culturing step, go straight to sequencing. Um, and ha then having an, our eyes on that um, on that cell, we now can start to say something about that organism. So here's a single cell sequencing workflow, but the bottom line is we take the environmental sample and then we have to sort out single cells. And there's fancy ways and then um, ways that also involve like looking at what you're trying to um, to sample first, like laser capture microdissection, but you need to get a single cell in a tube. And then from that single cell, extract the DNA from it. And then goes this um, whole genome amplification step. And then from there, once this works, you can get it go into, um, into genome analysis. But one of the things our lab has been really um, focused on is, is going just simply to to this step here where we're just trying to get a barcode, but we don't want just ITS. So we were, we were using this long R RNA PCR protocol developed by Christian Wurzbacher. And it involves amplifying most of the SSU and LSU. And then we run this on Oxford Nanopore, and then we can place it into the phylogeny. And one of the projects we've, we've um, focused on is, the, uh, is trying to go in and sequence the um, predatory zygomycetes, the predatory zoopagales, which are taxa that have not been amenable to culturing. And this was work done by William Davis and Kevin Ames, where they um, discovered the taxa and, and then got them into tubes and then sequenced them. And there's some really interesting fungi here, like zoophagus is, um, that trap rotifers, and then you can see that the nice hyphae growing inside the rotifer. Here's an amoeba that's, um, that's being attacked by cochlonema. And this is an example of, you know, how you can make a tree now that you have this, this data from the single cells and start to identify and put names on some of these like environmental DNA. And these were all amoeba parasites. So this, this becomes useful now that we have matches to some of these um, environmental sequences, we can imagine what they're doing. Here's an example um, where we sampled at uh, in Northern Michigan in Smith's Fen as a place that's historically been sampled for um, by chytrid biologists. And we kind of attacked this place with both single cell sequencing and as well as um, um, as uh, meta barcoding. And one of these um, samples, William Davis identified this chytrid here is on this green alga desmidium. And we were able to match it closely with uh, this 
PacBio sequence from just from extracted and sequenced from from the the water there. And this groups within synchytrium, which is an in interesting, important um, result because synchytrium is mostly known as as vascular plant parasites. Uh, this is just uh, you know in a in the last example, but we're um, we're also working together with Mike McKay um, on um, diatom blooms in Lake Erie and. These diatom blooms seem to occur um, under the ice in the middle of the lake. Um, and of course, where there's diatoms, there's going to be chytrids. And we're finding a, a great diversity of chytrids that are uh, associated with these winter diatom blooms. And this is work done by Kensuke Sato and Rayburn Simmons. And they're, they're now able to um, to identify this major group of diatom parasites that are important in Lake Erie and also bring some of these um, unnamed uh, dark matter sequences to, to, the, um, to being able to say these are probably also diatom parasites. Okay, so just a little bit of time left. Um, so we can observe those, those taxa and now we can start to, we can see those cells. So Kensuke is finding those cells in, um, in the environment and then going straight to DNA sequence and then putting it in phylogeny. We would also like to go further and, and do um, genome, um, genome sequencing so that we can start to actually say something a little bit more about the function. Um, so here's a cute diagram uh, that Doina, I think it was Doina made for her recent paper on the pipeline for single cell genome sequencing. And, um, you know, so you've had this pool of diverse cells and eventually you want to use various approaches to get down to a single cell. And, um, and then you've got that and, and now you sequence its genome. What can you say about it? Well, one of the issues you have is that you, you really don't have the whole genome because it's single cell. Um, and, and so you need to understand that the absence of, of a gene is not really telling you anything because it could just be a technical reason why it's not there. So you have to work with what you do have. So one of the things we, we can do is we, we could estimate ploidy. We could um, look to see if the if it makes a flagellum because there's a lot of genes associated with making flagellum, mitochondrion, ditto. Um, and then we can look and see what nutrient transporters it has. What could it take up? What could it um, excrete? We could look for defense genes and we can look at known cell wall genes, genes for hyphal growth, um, carbon utilization, and then we can also look for endosymbionts or also effectors. So the endosymbionts thing is, is relatively interesting and easy. If they're present in your single cell, it might stick out really, um, really nicely or really obviously. Um, that said, single cell sequencing is known to be subject to a lot of contamination. But in this particular case, we have this uh, nematode predator, um, Stylopagy, which consistently had the presence of this bacterium. And we became really convinced that this bacterium was actually inside the cells because the, um, the endosymbiont of the Stylopagy is closely related to these Morturella endosymbionts, which I think Greg Benito is going to talk about tomorrow. Um, so you can find this really interesting endosymbionts. Um, that's you know a case where we knew the target. We put that spore in the tube. Um, but there's also cases, and this is work done uh, by Stephen Art and Doina Shivano at the JGI, where we go back to Smith's Fen, for example, and we sample random cells by flow cytometry. One of the things to, to note is this is like genome completeness. And, um, you know, some of these cells, these ones in blue are the ones I particularly want you to look at, have pretty low completeness sometimes or mediocre completeness. So... Um, these present a challenge, but also an opportunity to sort of peer into what these dark matter fungi are doing. So one of these cells, BAOUC, is this here in the um, cryptomycota. Um, we don't have much data for it. Uh, it's a very low number of genes, but 
just using this approach, and this isn't completely cooked down, but um, we could say like, okay, it seems to have a mitochondrion, but lack of flagellum. We couldn't detect chitin synthase, um, but there's only so many genes in the genome for that, and we're really incomplete here. Um, and then our other approach where we find the thing and we put it in the tube, like the zoopagy, um, we can say a little bit more because we know, you know, the host is an amoeba. Um, the, the actual reactions and sequencing works better because we have many cells here. Um, so I'm going to wrap up with the take-home points. Um, you know, their dark matter fungi are um, really wherever you look, um, and there's plenty of, of surprises yet to be had, but we probably have, have sampled the ma majority of the lineages that are out there. Although there is a caveat that, you know, if we change approaches, we might start seeing different things, i.e. not just doing ITS sequencing. Um, yeah, so when I discuss these other major points, I see that I'm out of time. Um, I wanted to put up this quick note that we are trying to um, use this reverse ecology approach to 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 really understand fungi better and to just to start to develop the methods. And I'm looking for someone to join the group. I'm also um, interested in uh, and a postdoc fellow who will be interested in working on um, amphibian symbiosis and model, specifically model development with this um, dwarf African frog. There are so many people to thank um, for the contributions to this, these projects I discussed, um, particularly the folks in, in the lab. You've been a really stimulating group to work with. Um, real honored to have, um, have the chance to work with you. Um, these folks at the top here were really instrumental to the work I talked about today. Also, thanks to um, the Joint Genome Institute for their collaborations with the Single Cell Genomics. And thanks. Uh, I think I'm out of time. Look forward to discussing further with you.